Have you seen what's happening in your sanctuary lately? Join us right now for another episode of Your Sanctuary, a program that highlights what makes our National Marine Sanctuary so special and the people that keep them that way. Welcome to another episode of Your Sanctuary. Our last few episodes have had a research and policy focus, but today I want to highlight something just as important, and that's the role our committed volunteers play in a variety of stewardship activities for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Over 250 volunteers give their time, energy, and talent to sanctuary programs each year. And to tell us more about sanctuary volunteers is Lisa Emanuelson, who manages several of our volunteer programs. Welcome to your sanctuary, Lisa. Thanks for having me. You bet. Now tell us about these amazing volunteers, who they are and, and what they do for us. Well, we have lots of different programs with the sanctuary. We have volunteers that come from all walks of life. We have students, we have retired folks, we just have so many different people. And they're involved in programs that entail citizen science, interpretation, interpretive enforcement, and also just plain being out there to be our, our, our eyes and ears. That's great. You mentioned citizen scientists. What is that? What, do, what does that mean? Well, we have volunteer programs focused on collecting information about water quality. So we have volunteers that go out, oftentimes at some of the most unlikely hours of the day and night, to collect water samples that we have tested for things like bacteria and metals coming off of our streets during the first major rainstorm. So these volunteers are collecting data. What do we do with that data? Well, the data is reported back to local cities, for example, for first flush, and then that helps the cities to decide where they're going to do different mitigation efforts to try and improve water quality that's flowing into the sanctuary. Okay, and so we have all kinds of volunteers doing all kinds of things. What are some of the other volunteers doing that aren't collecting data? Well, other volunteers that we have are stationed along the recreation trail in Santa Cruz or also in Moss Landing in Monterey. And they are talking to folks along the rec trail using binoculars on tripods and just showing people that are passing by local wildlife, talking to them about otters and harbor seals and birds and that sort of thing. So those are our interpretive volunteers or some of the interpretive volunteers that we have. And then other programs that we have involve folks going out on kayaks to help other kayakers understand about approaching sensitive wildlife too closely. We have a lot of really sensitive wildlife around here like otters and harbor seals. And if people get too close continually, it really can affect their health in the long run. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun, actually, to be out on the water and be a volunteer for the sanctuary. Are there opportunities to do things all year round, or is it focused on any particular time of year? Absolutely. We have lots of different programs for folks to get involved in. Not every program is available all year, but pretty much if you come to me any time of the year, I can find something for you to get involved in. That'll be a lot of fun, and it'll be contributing to not only the sanctuary, but to the local information that we have. So if people are interested in volunteering, how do they do that? Do we just call the main line or, or what? Absolutely. People can call the sanctuary office's main line, or they can also reach us through our website. There's a tab for volunteer programs. And my name and number is listed on a lot of the volunteer program sections. Oh, great. Lisa, thank you so much for coming on to your sanctuary. In 2011, volunteers contributed 4,842 hours of service to local sanctuary programs. While this can be quantified at a value of $115,725, it is priceless. Also joining me in the studio today is Carolyn Skender, Southern Region Program Coordinator from our San Simeon office. While Carolyn's role is multifaceted, her primary focus is the Sanctuary's first visitor center, the Coastal Discovery Center at San Simeon Bay, which she operates in partnership with California State Parks. Carolyn, thank you so much for making the trip up. Great to be here, Paul. So tell us about this Coastal Discovery Center. 
Well, it's an interpretive center. It's located right across from Hearst Castle Visitor Center. And like you said, it's run in collaboration with California State Parks. What we focus on is the land-sea connection. We have several exhibits on natural history as well as the cultural history of San Simeon Bay. And tell us about these amazing volunteers. They do everything. They run the center, they man the desk, they participate in an annual oceans fair and run it actually. They also participate in citizen science programs such as a plankton monitoring program, water quality monitoring program, beachcombers which monitors uh, cast marine mammals and birds and they work with all of our school groups as well. Well I've been able to go down and spend some time with your volunteers and they are a fun and dedicated bunch. Tell us a little bit more about who they are. They are high school students, they are retirees, they're working teachers, they are retired professors, lawyers, librarians, policemen, all with an amazing interest and passion for teaching our visitors about ocean conservation and the sanctuary and about California State Parks as well. Their role is so critical there. What would we do without the volunteers with our programs? We wouldn't have any programs because they honestly make it all work, make it all happen. Uh, in addition to that, they're ambassadors for both California State Parks and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And outside of working for us, they're constantly promoting our sanctuary and its mission. This Coastal Discovery Center has had a big impact on the community. Tell us about the community connection. We work with our partners. Um, at the Piedras Blancas Light Station, uh, California State Parks, which I already mentioned, Friends of the Elephant Seals, the Marine Mammal Center. We all work towards getting across the same messaging. In addition, we work with the local school groups. We work with the Chambers of Commerces. We put on the fair every year, which is a celebration of all of our partners and everything they've done together with us throughout the year. And the town is very familiar with us and doesn't hesitate to call if they need something. So we have a far reaching effect all the way down in the southern region. Yeah, so a uh, reminder of viewers where the center is and the uh, hours of operation. Absolutely, the center is located right at the end of Big Sur Coast off Route 1, right across from Hearst Castle Visitor Center exit. Our hours of operation for the Coastal Discovery Center are Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, holiday Mondays, and holiday weeks. We also um, operate school programs during the school year, and for that they just need to give me a phone call. And um, there's our website, which they could just simply Google the Coastal Discovery Center at San Simeon Bay and get all the information that I just talked about. Well, that's great, Carolyn. Thanks again so much for coming on your sanctuary. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. It's time for another hospitality segment on Your Sanctuary. You know, there are so many great restaurants on the Monterey Peninsula, so many great places to enjoy great food and great ambiance. I'm here today on Fisherman's Wharf in Monterey, one of these special places, and I'm gonna be visiting with Dominic Mercurio, who owns Domenico's and Cafe Fina. Fisherman's Wharf is such a famous tourist destination, but we see a lot of locals down here too. Why do you think Fisherman's Wharf is one of these special places that people come to time and time again? Well, a perfect example is right behind me. You know, we have the harbor. Uh, it's different every day when, when it's high tide, low tide, the surges, the boats coming in and out. They're hanging on for their dear life when there's a big current. Uh, the shoreline, it's almost uh, soothing and relaxing. Uh, and people will just come here and sit and sometimes they won't even speak you know, just by staring at the shorelines. And the harbor life, I mean, the sea lions are playing all day, the pelicans are diving on a school of sardines. I mean, it's different every day. It's, it's, a, it's a real special place to come and, and we take it for granted because we see it every day. We don't realize how fun these sea lions are to watch chasing each other and, and, and trying to figure out how to get on that rail. People don't understand that, but it's really cool to watch. You know, they balance on a two by six. It's sort of cool, you know. Dominic, tell us about Domenico's and Cafe Fina. The food, the atmosphere, the history, you know, your special touch to these places. Well, you know, being born and raised here, coming from a fisherman family, on my father's side and uncles, and on my mom's side, uh, my uncle was a restaurant tour and he still is. He's, 
been here, one of the best chefs on the Monterey Peninsula, is all we know is local. You know, we didn't know about Arctic char and scrod and tilapia. We knew how to cook local fish in season. You know, that was sustainable. We knew sustainable was normal. We, we hated the farmed aspect of the fishing because it was cutting into our family's livelihood. It, it affected the business. But, you know, we've, we cook how, the things that we've been cooking for most of our lives. And we're good at it. I learned from grandparents you know, grandmothers, grandfathers, local cooks, and, and that's what we did is we ate our local fish. Plus, I got into about 15 years ago, we grow our own vegetables. I have a little ranch in Los Banos and we grow all the heirloom stuff, all organic. Uh, and it's, it's sort of those two things marrying each other. It's pretty tough to beat. You know, with, with now with salmon season and local sardines and you get petroli sole, we realize how lucky we are to, to, to live here. And we're spoiled. You know, I was just up someplace and, you know, we, we were looking at the, these, these top restaurants and there was no local fish. It was sort of a, a little disappointing, you know, but we try to strive on that. We want to support the locals. We want to do the right thing, and uh, that's we've sort of did it before it was trendy, to be honest with you. That's, that's what we do. You and your family have a strong and passionate connection to the ocean and to Monterey. Tell us about your relationship to this special place. Well, I'm, I'm here because my father landed here chasing those little sardines. Uh, come from a fisherman family, like I said. My father uh, started fishing sardines here uh, at the at the tail end. He was, the, he was the youngest brother, so the oldest brother came first and they save enough money for the, the next brother and the next brother. And anyway, by the time my dad got here, uh, it was pretty much the tail end of the sardines. But he still ended up getting, going on those purseiners and, you know, those purseiners still had to work even if the sardines thinned out. But, uh, and he ended up tuna fishing, I think, in South America is what, what he did. But my brother, uh, uh, is in Alaska as we speak. I fished in Alaska commercially for 20 years. I fished out here, but it was more for sport. But my brother was a commercial fisherman. So, you know, my, my grandmother's neighbor were in the fishing business. Cafe Fina used to be the original Monterey Fish Company. That's where Monterey Fish Company started. And that was my grandmother's neighbors. So it, there's, there's a big tie. I, I mean, and being in the fishing industry uh, and, and knowing uh, all the people that grew up in this area, we get first crack at a lot of stuff. We're lucky. You know, you could talk to my brother Sam, and somebody says, uh, where, did, where did the uh, halibut come from? And he'll, get, he'll call some guy that was fishing halibut and say, hey, Anthony, where'd you get, you know, where are they getting the halibut right now? You know, what's going on? And boom, he'll, he'll tell them right away. You know, and so uh, Monterey is a special place. Fisherman's Wharf has carried Monterey on its back for 100 years. I mean, there's no question about it. Monterey is a special, special place. And the wharf, the history that's here, people really, really don't realize um, how lucky we are to be and come down this wharf and look at the sea lions, the seagulls, um, and, and eat some of the local, local fish that, that's caught in the area. You don't see that a lot. And uh, we strive very, very hard to to try to support the local people and the local fishermen. Dominic, tell us a little bit more about Cafe Fina. I started Dominico's in 1981. Uh, my uncle and I were partners here, and I ventured off on my own and opened Cafe Fina in 1989. And I was actually gonna get out of the restaurant business for a little while and buy a, a fishing boat and move to Seattle and be, become a commercial fisherman when the owner, uh, the previous owner of Cafe Fina, which then was Gino's, famous seafood and steaks, was my grandmother's neighbor and told me, do you remember uh, when you were little, I told you if I ever sold, I would sell to you. So he called me a couple days before Christmas. I had the money because I was going to go buy a boat. So I brought it right over to him and it was just, it was meant to be. But that was actually, I mean, when we were young, we used to run up and down this wharf. I used to, we used to jump off that restaurant this restaurant when it was loose because we had easy access and the one at the end 
because it had stairs going up them. And we used to, there was about five or six. We used to do it every summer till the harbor master used to come and try to chase us around. And he could never catch us because we used to run underneath the wharf. There was a big walkway underneath. And uh, we, had, we had a lot of fun. But anyway, into Cafe Fina, I started, uh, I got a brick oven. I, I went to Europe a couple years prior and saw wood burning ovens. So I really wanted one because you could cook pizza, you could roast, cook fish, meat, you name it. It was just one of those pieces of equipment where you can do anything you want. So anyway, I had it imported over, which now they build them here, which is about one third of the price. But I was the first person in Monterey to get an actual wood fired oven. We we're making our own pasta. That was sort of a special deal now. Uh, and I think we're one of the few places that actually make it on premise. We do the linguine, fettuccine, angel hair, um, fusilli, and anything special that we do. And we do the, we do the flavored pastas and things like that. Dominic, a lot of celebrities and famous people come to Monterey and Fisherman's Wharf. I bet some of them come to Cafe Fina, right? Well, you know, you've seen the pictures, so that, that's why you're asking. You know, we're very, very lucky. We've had, I mean, Joe DiMaggio. How many people can say they, they have a picture and a signed baseball with Joe DiMaggio. John Madden, the, the, the football guru. I mean, the one that started X's and O's on the Telestrator. Uh, Payne Stewart, you know, Joe Pesci. It goes, I mean, it, it goes on and on. But the, the, the memories with these people, I, I remember when Jay Leno came in. He was here for the car show, obviously. And so I make this beautiful seafood spread for him. I got all these special things lined up for him. He wanted a sausage pizza. He doesn't eat seafood. I was not happy about that. But there's nothing you could do. He was allergic to seafood. Was all he, he wanted a sausage pizza, which was fine. But it was, it was funny. You know, you get, you get in your mind, everybody likes fish. Not everybody likes fish, you know. But some of the other celebrities... Uh, uh, you know, of course, a lot of golfers because of the Pebble Beach area and uh, Goldie Hawn, Mario Andretti, you know, it, it goes on on just cool people that have great stories and uh, uh, have lot, uh, left a lot of great memories and become friends. And, you know, along with repeat customers, uh, it was great getting a call direct from the track from Mario Andretti making a reservation or Johnny Miller. You know, it, that's, that's a pretty cool thing, you know, and, and uh, uh, John Madden's a very good customer of ours, and, and uh, we met in the restaurant. It was about 21 years ago. He was walking up and down the wharf, and it's all he wanted was clam chowder. So he was with his wife, and he was sort of trying to stay low-key. 6'6", six, six, doesn't stay low-key. So I, wa I walked up to him and I said, what are you looking for? You looked at this menu three times. What do you want? He goes, I'm just looking for some good clam chowder. So I said, go sit at that table. I'll bring it to you. If you don't like it, don't pay and don't come back. He came back seven Sundays in a row. We ended up being friends. He asked me if I knew some guys that liked to play poker. And he had some guys. And we've been the same po playing cards, the same guys. For about 21 years, a couple have changed and passed on, but uh, John and I are now uh, partners. We have the ranch. That's where I grow all my vegetables for the restaurant is in Los Banos, and it's JD Farms, which is John and Dominic, and, and we've been friends ever since, and, and uh, it's been a great relationship. And then just someone walking down the wharf to come and have some good clam chowder, and, and that's how it started. Our next segment is Sanctuary Heroes, which is a shout out to our ocean champions. First of all, to start out with, REI's mission is to inspire, educate, and outfit for a lifetime of outdoor adventure and stewardship. So when it comes to stewardship, this event, the Snapshot Day, is iconic. It's groups of volunteers from all over the entire Monterey Peninsula gathering together on a gorgeous day to take care of this cherished national sanctuary by testing the waters in the watershed around it. So it's our great privilege to sponsor this event, host it, but the real heroes of the event are the volunteers and the organizations in this peninsula that come together to work to protect these precious lands that we all enjoy for recreation and to protect them 
in conservation. It's really important that people come out and help monitor the creeks to see where the hot spots are that may need help. And it gets people uh, educated like me to find out uh, how are we doing in respecting and protecting our creeks. So Snapshot Day and the effort by the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is a great day and it's a beautiful day today too. And Every year there's a whole lot of people that are involved with this to set it up and then the volunteers that really make it happen. And so I'm always happy to be here whenever I can. As of June 1st, 2012, Volunteers for the National Marine Sanctuary System have donated over one million hours of service in stewardship of America's ocean treasures. Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Team Ocean volunteers provide on-the-water education information aimed at protecting sanctuary resources while enriching the experiences of visitors to Florida Keys and make a difference in the health of the ecosystem. Team Ocean volunteers are stationed on sanctuary vessels at heavily visited reef sites throughout the Keys during peak recreational boating seasons and holiday weekends. Volunteers inform the public about the sanctuary and its special zones, encourage proper use of sanctuary resources, and provide tips on how to practice basic safety. Boat groundings frequently occur because boaters are unfamiliar with the water and with the need to navigate around the reefs instead of motoring directly across them, Team Ocean volunteers directly prevent groundings by being present, watching for errant boaters, waving them off when they attempt to cross a shallow reef crest, and providing teals guides and charts to help familiarize new or visiting boaters with the sanctuary. Informational packets are offered to vessels and include charts, sanctuary information, and other helpful tips for navigating Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Team Ocean volunteers also participate in beach cleanups. Last year, Team Ocean staff and volunteers collected more than 10,000 pounds of marine debris. Hi, we're here with Steve Pedersen on his farm, High Ground Organics, in the Watsonville area adjacent to Harkin Slough. Tell us a bit about your farm here. Well, High Ground Organics is a small direct market farm. We farm on about 45 acres. Uh, we have three different sites. Um, and we, most of our produce is sold through a subscription program or a CSA. Uh, we also sell at farmer's markets and, uh, and at a farm stand that we have on, on Highway 1. So we sell a, a wide variety of, of vegetables. Um, and, uh, and fruits too. We have a, a pear orchard, a apple orchard. Um, we, we grow blueberries and, uh, and strawberries as well. So Steve, how did you originally get into farming? As it turns out, my uncle was one of the uh, early organic farmers in this area. He's, he'd been farming here since the, the late 60s, early 70s. And when I was a kid, I would, I would come up and uh, work on his farm during my breaks uh, from school in summer, and that was my, uh, my first introduction to it. So, Steve, how is your farm connected to the ocean? It's, it's very closely connected. We're actually right on Harkin Slough, which is one of the biggest uh, fingers of the Watsonville Slough system. So um, it, it flows actually right out into, uh, into the Pacific Ocean, not more than two miles from here. So we're very, very closely connected. At High Ground Organics, you're doing a lot to set yourselves apart in terms of environmental stewardship. Tell us about some of the things you're doing on your farm to make a difference in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Our whole approach is kind of shaped by, by being in a very sensitive area. Um, we've kind of taken a, an approach to managing it uh, based on, on the fact that, that all of the agricultural runoff from the farm would end up right in the slough itself. So a lot of things that we do are based around that. We've uh, a lot of the real steep erosive hillsides we put into perennials so that they're there is an exposed soil during the winter time. They're stable. They're stabilized. We also, uh, for the annuals and the vegetables that we grow, we grow on contour, which is kind of a unique around here. Most growers put their beds going up and down uh, the hillsides, which expose them to erosion. We also have taken certain sensitive areas out of production and planted uh, riparian trees and, uh, and and buffer strips so that they're 
they're stabilized from, from runoff and, and winter rains. So. Steve, who do you collaborate with to improve environmental stewardship on your farm and on other farms in the region? We've worked with uh, quite a few different groups, including the RCD, um, Resource Conservation District, the NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation District, and uh, to a certain extent with the University of California, um, the Cooperative uh, Extension. Uh, the NRCS has been particularly helpful. They, uh, we've, we've, been, we've had contracts through their EQUIP program uh, to make improvements based on around uh, conservation here. Um, they've also had advisors that have helped advise us on planting cover crops and different practices like that. So all in all, we've had quite a lot of help. Why is ocean conservation important to you? Well, I have two kids and, and we enjoy spending time at the ocean itself, but it's uh, it's it's our habitat. It's it's extremely close. Our our farm runoff ends up directly going into the ocean, and and I I fully realize that uh, as a farm, we can have a, a critical impact in that area. Here at High Ground Organics, you really demonstrate the important role that farmers play in protecting marine resources while maintaining the productivity of your farm. We really want to thank you, Steve, for making a difference through water quality stewardship. We started our Sanctuary on the Street segment to find out what you think about sanctuary subjects. Let's go to Steve Elsey right now and see what he's discovered. We are here at the Farmer's Market in Old Town, Monterey. We're going to find out how far people would go to make a difference in protecting the ocean. How far would you go to make a difference in saving our oceans? Well, I can't actually answer that question because I don't know what my viable options are for what I could contribute. I, I want to say I'd go as far as, you know, really trying to save it. I don't think I've done anything for the oceans and I kind of, kind of feel bad now. Probably make some changes in my lifestyle and um, if I knew that it really counted, I guess. Are you currently making a difference in saving the ocean? Um, I believe so, but I'm not entirely sure about it. I mean, well, Josh, what are you doing right now that you believe so? I recycle. I you know those little soda can things like six packs, twelve packs. I cut those. So if that happens, and then I'd save water. You know, even though I take long showers. Do you think we can change the way people behave about the oceans with films? Uh, yeah, I think uh, you can. Uh, there was just a movie out there about the whales and about the um, blue whales that really did touch me in a way that I thought was very effective. Would you wrestle with sea monkeys? Sea monkeys? Uh, sure, I guess. Sea monkeys, yeah, okay. All right. Would you wrestle with sea monkeys? Wrestle with sea monkeys? Uh, if they're friendly sea monkeys, yeah. Yeah, I would. Would you swim with sea monkeys? Sure, with my fingers crossed, I guess. <laughs> and could you tell us what a sea monkey is? I'm not sure what a sea monkey is, actually. <laughs> I'm just kind of going with what you're saying. 